Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. This is our third in our six-part series of civic engagement. Tonight, our topic is in the environment and water quality. Um, just a little bit about the process. The process that we use here tonight is the same process that we used in 2015 with our community conversations. Um, our facilitator at that time, and as well now, is the UCF Center for um, Government, Institute for Government. Marilyn Crotty was our facilitator at that time, and she recommended that we invite our elected officials to welcome everybody, but encourage them not to participate or attend so that we could, or, or stay for the meeting, so we could have this area as free from politics as possible and allow you to share openly your ideas and opinions. And that's the same process that we've been following with these workshops. All of our stuff is online. Your, everything is videoed. All the fishbowl questions are online. All the materials are online. All the presentations are online. So if you missed this or you want to see what happened, please go back and take a look at that. Tonight, we have some very special guests joining us. We have four individuals that are experts in their field. Mr. Clay Henderson, he's an attorney and he's the executive director of the Stetson Institute for Water and Environment Resilience. So we're glad to have you, Mr. Henderson. Also with us tonight is Jennifer Mitchell. She's a PhD from the University, uh, from St. John's River Water Management District. Likewise, we have Curtis Burkett with McKimmon Creed, and they do work for the city, but none of these professionals are being paid for their uh, presentations tonight. They're donating their time and talents. And then last but certainly not least is Brad Blaze with uh, Mead Hunt. They likewise do professional engineering services for the city, but they are not being compensated in any way for their uh, presence here tonight. That being said, I would like to welcome you, and we'll get this meeting started. Thank you very much. Okay, so if, if I can ask, um, just to get a sense of the room, how many of you have not been to either of the first two meetings? Okay, so it's, it's actually a fair percentage of the room. How many of you have been to both of the previous meetings? Okay, so a, a larger percentage of the room. Uh, let me go over a couple of basics about how, uh, first about uh, the organization I and my colleague Hal are with, and then uh, a little bit about how we'll run the meeting and what we're hoping to achieve with the meeting. Um, as Joyce said, my name is Rafael Montalvo. Hal Beardall, uh, a colleague, will be working with me. We are here under the auspices of the Institute of Government at UCF, and Hal and I specifically are also with an organization called the Consensus Center. Uh, it is actually a state entity, it's not a private uh, group. It was created to help uh, people in Florida discuss important and sometimes controversial public policy issues in a constructive way. And we do that by providing process assistance. We're here tonight to moderate the discussion. Um, we help design some discussions that we hope will allow all of you to have your perspectives heard. Um, we have a fairly full room tonight and a limited amount of time. So there's a little bit of a trade-off here. The meeting won't allow literally everyone to, won't really ask any of you to stand up and speak directly, but you will be asked for your input in a variety of different ways. All of that input, whatever it says, will be um, recorded and transcribed and recorded as part of the meeting summary. Um, those of you who were here at the previous two meetings may have already looked at the summaries online. Um, if you offered input at one of the meetings, um, it's in there. The first way will be through some uh, polling devices that we'll go over in just a moment. There is a table discussion portion of the meeting. At the end of the table discussion portion, we will be asking you to write the issues you think the city should address in the areas of environment and water quality uh, on post-its and what you think the most important things are for the city to achieve regarding those issues over the next five years. We're asking you to do that individually. We will be asking you to talk to your neighbors at the table first about it, but you draw your own individual conclusions. 
And we are hoping, actually, that those conversations are rewarding in and of themselves. You don't often get a chance to sit down with others uh, from your community and talk about these things in a focused way. So we're hoping those conversations help you make up your mind, but we're asking for your individual input. Anything you write on those post-its will go into the meeting summary. During the, present the presentations, we will ask you to, if you have questions you want answered, to write them on these cards that are at your table and put them in the bowl in the center of the table. At the end of, that, uh, of the presentation time, we'll go around, we'll draw one card at random from each bowl and answer it as fully as we can. If it's, an ans if it's a question about the subject matter that's been presented, we'll refer it to the subject matter presenters. If it's a question about what the city is going to do, will do, we'll uh, refer it to city staff. If your question doesn't get answered during the meeting, it will be answered online after the meeting within 10 business days. Again, for those of you who have been following the process, you'll see that there are over 300 questions that have been answered in writing online from the previous meeting. Um, and, and so you will get an answer to your question. You may or may not get an answer to your question tonight, but if you go online, you'll get an answer to your question within 10 business days. Uh, the last uh, comment, uh, the last way to offer a comment, you'll see some easel pads at the back of the room. They're labeled comment wall. If you have a comment that isn't a question about a presentation or doesn't fit neatly into the discussion, write it on a post-it, put it up there, and it will also be in the meeting minutes. So again, a little bit of a trade-off. We know that many of you would really like to get up and say your piece here tonight, but there are a lot of you. So at most, we could only accommodate a few. We hope that the opportunity to share your perspective, talk to your neighbors, and see your perspective recorded and, and preserved for the record um, will be a worthwhile trade-off for you. Um, I think Joyce said this, but I do want to just emphasize that all of the input that's being gathered in these meetings is for the purpose of updating the, um, the city's strategic plan. That update will begin in the spring, and the, the commission will be working with the input from all of these meetings. So, Hal, is there anything I missed? Okay, so uh, before we get started with the presentations, and uh, we'll do this fairly quickly, I'd like each of you to take a, um, a polling device from the bowl in front of you, and we're going to run through a few questions very quickly. Um, on the polling devices, you're going to see questions, and there's going to be uh, a possibility of multiple answers from one to nine. Uh, to answer the question, you simply press the number of the answer you like best on your polling device, and then hit send. Once you hit send, it's over. <laughs> you, uh, you can't change your, uh, your answer. If you change your mind before you hit send, there is a clear button. You can hit clear and pick another answer, but try and, you know, uh, think about it before you press your answer and hit send. What we're trying to do with these questions is just get a sense of who's in the room tonight. We already asked you with a show of hands how many have been here before. These are the questions. Um, where do you reside? A one, Ormond Beach. Two, Ormond by the Sea. Three, Holly Hill. Four, unincorporated Volusia. Or somewhere else. So pick your answer, press the number, and hit send. And we should get a sense of how many folks are in the room with, with this question. Okay. Please do answer. Okay. We've got 86 responses. I, I'm pretty sure we have more than that in the room. But we'll okay, 87 going once, twice. Okay. So 89% of those who answered live in Ormond Beach. Another 3% in Ormond by the Sea, and no one from Holly Hill tonight. Uh, we have had in past meetings. 6% um, in unincorporated Volusia, and 2% somewhere else. Okay. What do you feel is your strongest connection to Ormond Beach? And s several of these may apply to you. We're asking you to pick the strongest one you feel. So as a resident, as a business owner, one is as a resident, two is as a business owner, Three is you work in the city, and four is something else. It can be anything. So pick your answers, hit send, or it won't count. Okay, going once, going twice, 
Only got 85 on this one. Six, seven, okay. Um, 88% of you think you feel your strongest connection to the city as a resident. Another 6% as a business owner. 5% um, from working in the city and 1% from other. Um, how long have you had this connection to Ormond Beach? We had someone at the first meeting who uh, grew up here and had lived here for more than 70 years. Um, one is you've had this connection for five years or less, two, six to 10 years, three, 11 to 15 years, four, 16 to 20, and five, more than 20 years. So whatever your strongest connection is, how long have you had it? Okay. Hit send or it doesn't register. Okay. Going once, going twice. 59% of you have had that connection for more than 20 years. 5% uh, for 6 to 10, another 15% um, for, oh, I'm, I'm doing it backwards, I apologize. 5% for 16 to 20, another 15% for 11 to 15, 2% for 6 to 10 years, and 19% for a year or less. So, um, 79% of you have had that connection for 11 or more years. Okay, last time we asked you your age, and we promised that would be the last time we asked that, um, it was relevant to transportation preferences and needs, but this is more relevant for tonight. What's the size of your household? One or two persons, that's a one. Three person, that's a two. Four person, three. And four or five persons or more. Again, hit send or it doesn't count. Okay, going once, twice. 79% um, of you are in one or two person households. Uh, an additional 10% are in three person households, 9% in four person households, and only 1% in five or more person households. So we will come back to some of this information later in the meeting, but for now, um, I would like to ask Clay to come up and start with the presentations. Uh, each presenter has about 10 minutes, so I apologize in advance. If you uh, look like you're going uh, over the cliff, I'll wave the, the yellow pad at you. <laughs> All right. Uh, how's this? There we go. <laughs> I have this. I have this feeling though that this is going to conflict. So let me just. Uh, I will take this off. Hold. We just know that's going to be a problem. Hello, good to see you. I am Clay Henderson. Louder, and, Clay. Uh, or okay. Whoa. All right. We're going to have to do rock and roll star, rock and roll star here. This. This is. Uh, can't, this does not sound good to me. How does it sound to you? Okay, very good. Well, hello. I'm Clay Henderson. I would be in the other category. I don't live here. I don't work here. Uh, I've lived most all my life in New Smyrna. Uh, we're a little ahead of you. We started doing meetings like this earlier in the year, and like this had been very, very well attended, and it's been incredible to see the public input that um, ha has come, and I think it's influencing their work there, and, and uh, hopefully you'll have the benefit of seeing your work uh, here uh, go into the city of Ormond Beach. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Institute for Water and Environmental Resilience at uh, Stetson University, and we're still, okay, there we go, which uh, we do this a lot. We work with uh, stakeholders, communities, uh, government agencies across the state to look at primarily water issues and help fashion uh, solutions uh, for some of these problems, which are really, uh, really uh, complex. Uh, there are no simple answers to these anymore. I've been asked to talk about wetlands tonight. Uh, it's been raining so much uh, in Central Florida this last year, I almost think everything could be classified as a wetland now, but not exactly. 
Um, we've had a year's worth of rain so far, and it is not yet September 1st, although it will be very shortly. Uh, wetlands are very important to Mormon in Volusia County in Central Florida. Uh, wetlands uh, are very special. We're going to hear a little bit about that. Uh, what are they? I mean, it's a pretty simple definition, but it gets very complex. The wetlands are lands that during uh, much of the year, it could be a short period of time or a long period of time, are inundated with water. And uh, we would see them in a lot of different ways uh, in the city and throughout. Uh, we certainly have wetlands along the Tomoka River and Tomoka Basin, the saltwater marsh. We have mangrove forests down in New Smyrna. You're starting to see a few mangroves work their way up here now. Uh, cypress domes uh, to the west of town. All of these kind of different types uh, of wetlands that, that you would see here. Um, and Florida is a special place because outside of Alaska, we have more wetlands here than any other state. Just think about it. We have this very long coastline, and they're affected by uh, wetlands both in the Gulf Coast and on the Atlantic and also up the St. John's River and other places. We have also lost more wetlands than any other state. Uh, almost half of Florida's wetlands have been ditched or drained or destroyed uh, over the last uh, more than 100 years. Uh, I assure you that our current president was not the first politician to say we're going to drain the swamp. We, <laughs> we actually elected a governor 100, over 100 years ago on that slogan, we're going to drain the swamp, and he did. He was incredibly successful, and literally tens of thousands of acres of wetlands uh, were ditched and drained in the state. Uh, this is a very high-level map of the wetlands that you would expect to see here in Ormond Beach. And, and you can tell what that is. That's the Tomoka Basin, the Tomoka River, uh, areas along the Halifax River. And then as you get out west of I-95, you have these isolated wetlands that are often like you'd see them as cypress domes or as marshes. Uh, and all across the central part of the county, you'd see that same kind of phenomena. Why do we care? Um, we care right now because we're still kind of in a post-flood condition after uh, the hurricane last year. We certainly are over on the western side uh, of the county. Wetlands are very important for flood control because that's the natural way that waters are kept and preserved and, and so they're not coming into your house. It's also the best and most effective way to clean the waters that we uh, are affecting or impacting by various pollution sources. So wetlands are very important uh, for those natural ecosystems system functions. And you know what? I think they look nice. You know, I think we got some pretty wetlands in Volusia County. I mean, Tomoka Basin and Tomoka River and the salt marshes, our mangroves, the St. John's River, pretty nice. Um, wetlands are very, very regulated. Big alphabet soup here. Uh, believe it or not, the Corps of Engineers is the major uh, federal agency with jurisdiction over wetlands. I know that doesn't make sense, but that's the way it is. In Florida, it's the Water Management District, DEP, um, and, and so they're very, very highly regulated, but also uh, at the local level uh, as well. Uh, wetlands were essentially not protected before the Clean Water Act, which is 1972. And I know it's just hard to imagine, but like before 1972, when you flushed the toilet, mostly in Volusia County, it went right in the river, you know. So th this whole idea of protection of our water resources and protection of wetlands is a fairly recent phenomenon. And in this county, we have minimum standards for a, a number of environmental matters, including wetlands. And so we protect wetlands in addition to uh, federal and state standards in Volusia. And Ormond Beach also has a, a local ordinance that protects wetlands, and it actually goes beyond uh, what the county does. So you have buffers that are protected around wetlands, and particularly around the tributaries uh, of the Tomoka River. So they're very highly regulated. Um, all wetlands are not equal. And so when the regulators are looking at standards for protection of the wetlands, they look at the natural function of a wetland. A tidal marsh is different from a mangrove forest, is different from a cypress dome in what they do. And so in Florida, we have a uniform standard called uh, UMAM that uh, puts a, a numerical scale on valuing each type of wetland, and that goes into the process of permitting uh, uh, for development. Um, 
the standard uh, for wetlands protection is no net loss of wetland function. Uh, the regulators, the city, the water management district, tried to discourage uh, developers from uh, uh, dredging and filling all the wetlands, try to get them to reduce their impacts, minimize their impacts, and if that can't be done, then mitigation is the process. They can mitigate on site, they can do their own restoration programs, but what we see mostly in Florida is the use of mitigation banks. This map up here in the top that you can't see too well shows all the different mitigation banks in Florida. We actually have more mitigation banks in Florida than any other state. Locally, uh, this gives you a feel for local mitigation banks, uh, which uh, includes the city of Port Orange, operates their own. Farmington is one of the largest banks uh, in the country, and, and a few others. So almost all of Volusia County is covered in what they call this uh, service area for, uh, for, for wetland uh, mitigation banks. So I think the last thing I want to say is that, that if you care about the Tomoka River and you care about the Halifax River, it's very important to protect all of these wetlands that are connect functionally connected to these waterways. Uh, it's good for flood control, it's good for the protection of uh, these water resources, and like it or not, almost all of the surface waters in Volusia County are now impaired under the Clean Water Act, and that includes the Tomoka River and the Halifax River. And so if you care about those resources, you know, you've got to care about wetlands too because that is a very key uh, uh, factor in being able to protect these large important resources. So uh, anyway, you just got the same kind of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of a presentation that my students get and they'll go on to working in jobs in this field and they'll be able to delineate wetlands and tell you what's a wetland and not and how we're going to protect them. And uh, so now you've all got the same, you know, you've all got the same degree. So go out and, and do good within your community. So I'll turn it back to you, Raphael. Thank you, Clay, and uh, don't go too far. Sorry, um, we're going to have mic difficulties. Um, a reminder, if you have questions about what Clay just presented, write them down and put them in the bowl, uh, either on the card or on a post, it, it won't matter. Um, I neglected to say earlier that in addition to our star presenters, we have two cameos tonight uh, uh, related to subject matter that's related to water quality and environment, but won't be, because it's, it's about what the city is doing, won't be covered directly by the subject matter experts. So uh, Steve Spraker is going to come up and talk a little bit about tree preservation. I know it was covered in community development. Some of you have indicated it's part of this issue as well. Uh, do you Good evening. My name is uh, Steve Spraker. Tonight we're going to go and over... And Steve, I didn't identify you, uh, your position with the city, if you would. I'm the planning director with the city of Orem Beach. And you've got a clicker there for the... Oh, thank you. So this presentation focuses on the land development code section, which includes landscaping. Um, the city landscape architect, as part of a site plan review committee, thank you, they, re they review for tree removal, mitigation, they review the landscape plans, and they review the landscape plans and the irrigation plans. They also implement the plantings when the project goes to construction, so they're out in the field making sure that they're planting what was on the approved plans. The city's landscaping article was approved in, in 2004, and there was one amendment done in 2004. So that's the last time that this article was amended. As part of a project development, a tree survey is required. Um, the tree survey is used by the applicant's uh, civil engineer and the landscape architect, and they come up with a site plan, and they come up with a tree removal plan. When projects are redeveloping, um, for example, uh, the Hamlin building at 801 West Granada, just, um, just west of the CVS, there a betterment plan is required. So what that focuses on is trying to bring up existing sites to the current land development code. Another project going through is the Luckies at the old food line. So they'll work on a betterment plan to try to improve the existing site. Section 3-04 of our land development code focuses on tree protection and tree replacement. So all sites must save 
specimen trees. So it's dependent on the size of the property, the amount of specimen trees that are required. And specimen trees generally range from 12 inches to 18 inches, depending on the species of the tree. For a heavily wooded site, each site's required to preserve 15% of the area for tree preservation. In addition to the preservation, there are landscaping requirements, and there's two standards that projects follow. The first is one tree is required for each 1,500 square feet of the entire lot, and one tree is required for every 400 square feet of land area. So the, the applicant will do that calculation, and then the higher ratio of that number is then used on the landscape plan. For uh, projects that remove trees, there is a mitigation requirement that's reviewed. So they're taking a look at the number of trees removed and the number of trees that remain on site. And there's a mitigation calculation that our landscape architect does. So the more trees that you save, the more credits that you will get. If you're, if you're deficient and you've moved more trees than you've saved, there's a, a landscaping requirement in addition to the site minimums. So it's not, I don't get to use my landscape minimums. I have to plant additional trees. And for specimen trees, those are four and a half inch caliper trees. Our land development code requires buffer areas, and these areas are based on um, what's, what's adjacent to the property. It could be a roadway or it could be a use. So there are buffer types within our land development code that um, go based on the use of the, the property and then the abutting use. Along major corridors such as West Granada Boulevard, uh, Hand Avenue, Clyde Morris Boulevard, um, Interstate 95, there are green belt buffers. So there's a higher level of landscaping on those, those corridors. Um, it's dependent on the, the depth of the property. If you're 200 feet or less, there's a 25 foot buffer. If you're 200 foot or greater, there's a 36 foot buffer. And then when you get along I-95, there's a 60 foot required buffer. The buffers can be natural. So if they can leave them in a natural state, they can be natural. They can be planted, or they can be a combination of the natural and planted. A uh, good example of that would be the Vi Star that was just planted. They have both uh, natural trees and they have planted uh, landscape materials. Our code uh, has requirements for both landscape and irrigation plans. Some of the highlights, um, at least 50% of the land, landscape area is required to be xeric, which is drought tolerant plantings. There are landscaping islands that are required for every 10 parking spaces. Uh, for subdivisions, street tree, street tree plantings are required. And then the land development code contains specific planting material. Um, Florida number one is, is what's required. So there's a minimum standards of when you're actually going to replant. And then an irrigation plan is also required. Switching to single family houses, there's also standards for those. So if you're in the REA, which is our agricultural zoning district, the standard is one tree for every 2,500 square feet. And if you're in a single family, it's one tree for every 1,500 square feet. Um, the, code the land development code requires a tree in the front yard and the rear yard. And if you do have specimen trees on your property, there's a calculation, again, based on the size of the property of how many specimen trees are required. Um, Similar to the commercial, there's a, a mitigation uh, for tree removal. And again, you can use on-site trees to credit. You know, if you're saving trees, you can use those. You can replant it. Or in the case where you don't have sufficient land area, you could pay into the tree fund, but that's a last, a last option. Tree removals for existing single family homes are reviewed and permitted by the city's neighborhood improvement. Historic trees are live oaks, <clears throat> bald cypress, and indigenous trees with an estimated age of 100 years and a diameter of 36 inches. Um, these trees are reviewed and, and acted upon by the city commission. The land development code does give the city landscape architect the ability to remove a historic tree if it's needed to be an imminent hazard to the public health, safety, or welfare. This is my contact, and I also included our city landscape architect. So we'd be more than happy to discuss anything in this presentation outside this. Thank you very much. And um, that presentation, all of the presentations today will be available online after today's meeting. So if you can't quite absorb that much, and I can't <laughs> that quickly. Um, Jennifer, I believe you're up next. All right. And again, hey, my microphone's working. So I am Jennifer Mitchell and I'm with the St. John's River Water Management District and I'm really excited to get to be here with you all today. And I was asked to give a five minute presentation about uh, permitting and I said, can I have a little bit more so I can talk about all of the ways that we as residents that live in the area also are able to have an impact 
a positive impact on our water quality and the amount of water that we're using. So we're going to start with a quick polling question of how much water do you think you use in a single day? So we're just talking one person in one day. And it's 0 to 25 for number 1. For number 2, it's 26 to 50 gallons. Number 3 is 51 to 75 gallons. 4, 76 to 100 gallons. Or more than 100 gallons. The results are coming flooding in. All right, it looks like we're holding steady there. So let's see for how much water we're thinking we use. So everybody thinks, or about 42% think they use between 26 to 50 gallons per person per day. So I'm going to give you a little spoiler alert. The average water management district resident uses 88 gallons of water per person per day. So we're going to talk about this in a little bit about where is it that we're using that water. So we might be using more than that 50 gallons, but maybe all of you guys that came out today are my super water conservers and you're the role models for the, the rest of the community. So for those of y'all who do not know what the water management district is or where we fall, we, they, we are one of five water management districts and we take up all the way down here in Indian River County, the headwaters of the St. Johns River, all the way up to Nassau and Baker County, which is uh, the St. Mary's and Nassau River. And then, of course, we know that the St. Johns River goes out into the Atlantic Ocean up in Jacksonville after it flows its 310 miles north. We, the water management districts, are divided on hydrologic or based on the watershed. So it's our, uh, the way the water moves versus our arbitrary county line. So it's fun for those counties that the water management districts lay across multiple. Uh, it, it adds a little bit of fun for their uh, tax collectors. But we are responsible for making sure that we as people have enough water into the future, but also so that our natural systems have enough water. So our core mission is to ensure that sustainable use of water for us and so that we're leaving enough in the aquifer. And so in order to do that, we have four core missions. We want to make sure that water supply, so the water that we're using, that we have enough of it so that we don't ever go to turn on our faucet and run out of water. We want to make sure that the water quality is of the appropriate quality, so we have monitoring sites across the state. We want to make sure that the projects that we're doing are, if the water is impaired, that we're improving the water quality. We have flood protection. One of the ways that we really encapsulate doing all three of these things is through our natural system. So we at the district own over 700,000 acres of land. A lot of them are those wetlands. By owning the wetlands and preserving and protecting them, when it floods, we're not flooding any structures. We're flooding areas that are supposed to. Those areas that flood uh, help in water quality be, be improved, acting as those kidneys. And it helps it to soak down into the aquifer, as we'll talk about in just a little bit. So we also are responsible, as our state agency, or as a state agency for permitting. We provide and are responsible for two different types of permits. You can see these folks up here working and looking at development plans and at stormwater infrastructure. One of those permits is going to be our environmental resource permit. These are going to look at things like endangered species. Is the stormwater infrastructure designed appropriately? So we want to make sure that the construction of whatever is occurring is not going to cause any off-site flooding or any flooding for the development that's occurring. And this is also looking at those wetlands and making sure that if there is development in wetland areas that it's mitigated, that, it's, uh, that those wetlands are preserved in the appropriate ways, all of those things. And so there are two agencies in our state that are responsible, DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, and us. We are both responsible for those environmental resource permits. Department of Environmental Protection does a lot 
with more of the industrial side of things, so wastewater, uh, mining, power plants. The other thing that might be of interest for, for people in here, if you have your own property and are not within a subdivision and are wanting to do some sort of construction and it happens to be on top of some wetlands, you have to work with DEP in order to make sure that you are not impacting them in a negative way. Or if you are a residential developer or a multi-use development, industrial roadways, or a marina with non-water dependent activity, I'm not sure what, how many marinas are not going to be water dependent, uh, but you would come through us. And so for these, these are the things that we're going to be addressing the stormwater infrastructure. We're wanting to make sure that uh, wetlands are uh, assessed appropriately. And so when we're looking at those wetlands, some of the considerations are what type of wetland is it? Is it isolated? Are there endangered species? Are there endangered plants that might be on the property? Are there endangered animals? Can they be relocated? Is it a continuous water body? So there's a lot of considerations when we're looking at wetlands. We want to reduce that impact as much as possible, but as developers own property and it's their personal property, we can only tell them so much how they can develop it. And so otherwise, if they are not able to mitigate or leave, leave wetlands intact, then they have to mitigate like in those wetland banks. So as we think about where are wetlands occurring, what causes wetlands, what are these water resources that the water management district is managing? It's really important that we understand the connectivity of water in our state. And I say in our state because we have this really tremendous, wonderful resource of the Florida aquifer that we so frequently take for granted. It is connected to our surface water. And Volusia County, I have a, a nice little map that shows us the recharge, but Volusia County is really an amazing county. So we have in Volusia County areas where there's recharge, so when it rains, that water goes really rapidly down into the Florida aquifer. And that Florida aquifer isn't stagnant. It's not just a pool of water sitting there waiting for us to pull it up, but it's constantly moving. And so it's moving towards our springs and comes up out of the aquifer. And so it's important to remember that there's that connectivity. And right now we're seeing so much of the standing water because there are these areas of our surficial aquifer where the, we've had so much rain that it's, it's full and so the areas where we're seeing standing water are slight depressions in the ground. And so we can see here the, the, that amount of recharge. So there are areas where water goes into the ground, and then there might be areas where it's coming up, or areas that that surficial aquifer occurs. And so Volusia County has about 1 to 10 inches of recharge a year. So that's an important thing to think about as you are thinking about development as well. And so you can also tell that our lot of rain that I'm talking about, across our entire district, we have had more than 13 inches of rain in the past year in comparison to that average. But if we look at even just Ormond Beach, and this is all of the rain that we've had till yesterday, I believe was when I made this graph, we get a little bit less rain in this area, but if we project how much rain was the average for all of these other years, you can see that it's well over 10 inches over that average. And so we're going to get a lot more rain throughout the year. So we're coming with, with a, a wet year from last year and a wet year this year. So don't be surprised if you see water is the biggest takeaway of that. Our consumptive use permits are going to be for those large water users, our municipal utilities, agriculture, and even things like uh, golf courses, so large water users. We require that they use the most appropriate water, so a lot of our golf courses, and a lot of the municipalities are even working to get irrigation on that reclaimed water, that treated wastewater. Irrigation is a wonderful source of that water because it's not going to be water that's coming up out of the aquifer. We also want to make sure that if water is being pulled up out of the aquifer, that it doesn't have any impact on the neighboring wells. So we have, make sure we have a lot of studies on that. So we have our water supply planning regions, making sure that we have that water into the future. 
is a really important part of what we're doing. And so at the district, we have these projections of how many people do we think are going to live here? How much water are they going to need? Where is that water going to be able to come from? And we come up with some of those projects. If you look at how water has been used, we can see that population across our entire district has reached over 5 million people. But we see these bottom two bars are municipal utility and private wells. It hasn't been growing at the same rate as population. So we are doing some really great things with water conservation. So you can take that and remember, we're doing good things with water conservation. Let's move it even further. And so when you think about how can we move it further, if we look at just Volusia County's water use for this past year, you can see that over 60% is us in our homes and our businesses. So we can be responsible for leaving more water in the aquifer if we can. We can do things like taking shorter showers, turning off the water, and ultimately it's that cost of water that's going to cause us to really start conserving. Because if we have to go to things like desalination, six to eight and a half times more expensive, where conservation is free. Knowing where you're using your water is really important. And reducing things like leaks, managing your outdoor irrigation, you can have big impacts. Make sure if you do have an irrigation system that you have it set to the right times and it's not in the middle of the day. And we have some great cost share programs that have gone on with the, the city of Ormond Beach. The most recent ones have been two reclaimed water infrastructure expansions. So these are really getting that water from, rather than going out to the Halifax River, using it for irrigation so that it is a beneficial use. And so if you're interested in what all's going on at the district, or if you're interested in having me come out and speak to your organization in greater depth, uh, feel free to get on social media and follow us, or you can email me as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, okay, uh, our next subject matter expert is uh, Cur Curtis. If you would come up. Uh, a quick word, our second cameo is going to be Sean Finley at the end of the presentations, letting you know where the city is and what the city is doing, letting you know very briefly what the city is doing on each of the subjects covered by our subject matter experts. Thank you. My name is Curtis Burkett. I'm with McKim and Crete. Uh, I'm speaking uh, briefly tonight just on some of the stormwater aspects and what the city's been doing after the rainfall hits the ground and we have to deal with that. First though, I have a question for you here. Do you live in a flood zone? Okay, this is a pretty simple question. First one is yes, number two is no, and number three is I do not know. People are getting pretty quick on these. Okay, so 79% say no, that they don't live in a flood zone, which that's good. If that's the case, that you don't live, 16% uh, say yes, and then 5% say you don't know. Okay, so let me step into this briefly, what we're talking about here. Stormwater, we've already talked a little bit about the wetlands perspective and everything else like that, but what really is stormwater? So stormwater is really the rainfall element of a storm event, okay? What we talked about with the recharge that is when it would percolate or be able to go back into the ground, say around your house or anything like that. Anything else becomes runoff. That runoff comes off of your yard, it comes off of your rooftops, it can come off eventually your driveways, and it goes into the street, which then eventually goes into drainage systems, and eventually will make its way somehow to a lake, a pond, a stream, a canal. Somehow it will get back into the natural environment. So the city is somewhat tasked with how do we manage that and how do they go about doing that. And they've done a fantastic job with some award-winning projects on that. So the city's responsibility, basically it's almost 33 square miles in size. They have over 98 miles of pipe systems that they're responsible for. They also have over 16 miles of ditches that they have to maintain and take care of. 
They maintain over 3,700 inlets, storm systems that go with that. And they also have 109 ponds that they're responsible for, as well as kind of keeping an eye on another 218 private ponds that exist within the city. And they do a lot of these based on the Clean Water Act that they talked about earlier, which really regulates how to keep track of all this different runoff from the storm events. So one of the ways that the city has been proactive in doing this, as in other communities have done around the state, is they enacted a stormwater utility that came into place in 2014. What that does is it set aside a certain amount of money every year that goes into some of these programs. Uh, last year, for example, it generated about $2.8 million that they could go towards trying to implement and maintain those systems that were described in that earlier slide. Some of the ways they do that is through street sweeping. You may think, how does that really affect? Well, that's taking a lot of the trash, debris, cigarette butts, all those elements off the street before they're able to flow into the streams and get out into your lakes and streams. Also, the city has a very aggressive capital improvement program, which helps to implement some of these larger projects that go in and start to address flooding in areas and help to maintain some of these systems. This center part of the slide here kind of gives you a little graphic to give you an idea that a lot of what you do individually can affect this as well. If you overflow your tank at, when you're filling up your gas, that could eventually end up in a stream somewhere. If you're putting in too much fertilizer on your grass, that could run off and get into a stream somewhere. Little things like that make a difference, so we can all be conscious of having an impact on our environment. So the cool thing about my part here is I get to talk about a couple award-winning projects. One of the projects, if you recognize here on the left-hand side of that slide, you might recognize that it's the Lake Park Circle area right around Hand Avenue. Uh, Zev Cohen was tasked with a project several years ago that went in to the tune of around three and a half million dollars and designed an award-winning project, which if you're familiar with it is, is the picture at the bottom, that went in and tried to address and successfully address the flooding that went on say from that picture, which was the no-name storm that happened in 2009. I was told by city staff that the last two hurricanes that we've experienced, this particular area, they had no reported home flooding in that particular location, which before, I believe, there were 74 houses at a minimum that flooded along with the streets were impassable, et cetera. So that project has held up very, very well and been a success. Another thing that you may not notice as a typical citizen that doesn't really have the eye for this, the top picture on the right is what an exfiltration system looks like, basically which is putting stormwater underground into pipes. Now you may think, okay, well, I don't, I've never seen that. Exactly, it's all covered up. The picture on the bottom there is actually Lincoln Avenue Park, if you're familiar with where that's at, that pipe system that you see there is actually under that park. So if you're walking on top of that park, right under that is actually a very massive stormwater system that's taking care of drainage from some of the local streets right around there. Another element that the city deals with is flood protection. The Hand Avenue project also incorporated an element of flood control and flood protection by interconnecting all five of the lakes that were out there in the Central Park area. So before the city would have to go out if they could, draw down lakes individually to try to get more storage. Now all five lakes are connected and it's administered a little further to the north by Bennett Lane Pump Station and they have the ability now to go in and draw those lakes down ahead of a major storm event to gain more flood control and more flood capacity within this location. Another cutting edge project that the city does is the Bennett Lane Pump Station. They're one of the only ones right now in the state of Florida that is actually working on a cloud-based computer program where they can electronically monitor the rainfall events that are projected to be coming into the future within a few days, which then allows them to go in and draw those lakes down ahead of a storm event and gain that extra capacity across there so that it, it allows more drainage from these residential streets to be able to get into these lake systems um, and reduce the flooding in the area. This has been so successful that the city is actually going to implement three more stations around the city to be able to monitor some more streams to be able to keep up with this. And this is becoming a, 
a, a project that other states and other municipalities in the state of Florida are looking to um, because it is so advanced. Now, another aspect I want to talk about is the stormwater quality. We've talked about inundation and flooding and things. The water quality part is just as important. What does a good managed stormwater system do? Well, it provides protection to the wetlands, uh, as they've talked about previously. It improves the quality of our receiving bodies, which means we can enjoy the recreation, we can go out and we can do a lot of the things around these water bodies we like. It helps conserve water resources, as Jennifer talked about. It also protects our public health, and it does provide the flood control. You may have seen this map earlier in the first presentation where it showed the wetlands within the city. Well, the pink that is up here now actually shows you the floodplain that is overlaid on top of these wetlands. And as you can imagine, most of the floodplains areas do fall within where you have your wetlands because they are depressed. The, to give you a, a reference, the farthest one to the right is actually the Halifax River, so we would hope that that would stay flooded. Um, but the other areas, as you can see, are the low basins that, li that fall within US-1 and Ridgewood, et cetera, that way. So you can see how the floodplain and a lot of the wetlands do overlay with each other very well. So these, this one slide here, I think, really represents what I call hidden gems within the city. Uh, the two pictures to the right are actually a Hand Avenue project where it shows the interconnect with the ponds. And you can see in the bottom picture, you have people that are out there in kayaks and canoes. So people would really look at this as thinking this is a great recreational benefit, not knowing that the system is actually providing a huge, huge amount of volume for flood protection for a very, very large drainage basin. Also on Hand Avenue, the top picture to the right is kind of a natural setting. It's more of a rain garden, an open area. And it's taking the water off of the street, it's getting it to be able to get treated and percolate in the ground, and then the treated water then overflows and goes back into the lake system. And then the bottom picture there is, again, the Lincoln Avenue area, which shows the beauty that can happen on top of some of these projects, even when there's stormwater treatment going on below. And last but not least, this is another award-winning project for the city. Uh, Sean Finley actually was the author of the city's low-impact development manual, which won an award for the city a year or so ago, wasn't it? Three years ago? Um, and what this manual is, is it is a, a manual that local developers or any developer or anybody coming into the city has the option, they don't have to do it, but they have the option of selecting to do some type of low impact development on their project. An example would be if they wanted to do pavers in their parking area, because pavers allow water to percolate into the ground quicker than just running off the surface automatically. They can also do rain gardens, which is up in the top area, and even locally, as a resident, you can see the one there example is a rain barrel. This is a very cutting edge um, manual that, that, that they have here in Ormond Beach. It's actually one of the first of its kind in Volusia County. And it is, a, I think, one of those type of documents that is start to set the precedence to lead the city into uh, some of the future developments that are going to occur. And that's it. Good evening, uh, Brad Blaze with Mead and Hunt. I'm going to talk to you all tonight about my favorite topic, uh, water and sewer. So uh, with that, we'll, uh, we'll jump right into it. Uh, on the water quality element, we'd like to kind of retread a little bit about what Jennifer discussed as far as who do we have to permit water plants, sewer plants, all these different types of facilities through. Um, basically, we have DEP, which covers the uh, groundwater management, drinking water, and, and the list of other items that are shown up there. And uh, primarily, DEP has responsibility for all of your uh, wastewater treatment, your discharge to surface waters, and all of those aspects that are related to uh, drinking water and or um, wastewater. St. John's covers the consumptive use permitting, any wells over four inches, in addition to ERP permitting for facilities such as industrial plants, uh, water plants, and, and sewer. And then Volusia County handles your small well septic systems and public water systems. This is uh, the city's uh, water treatment plant. Uh, that's, I don't have a nifty uh, um, picker here, but who all knows where the city's water plant is? Can we all raise our hands? Okay, that's a, a fairly large percentage. Uh, the water plant is just 
west of US-1 and just south of Granada. Uh, it's in the Jefferson, Jefferson Street area, and um, you can see it kind of runs linearly along the railroad tracks there. It's a unique plant. It's got a capacity of uh, 12 million gallons per day, and currently the consumption from the plant is about 5.4, so it's a little less than half of that. One of the unique things about your city's plant is that it treats water via lime softening. So 8 million gallons per day is lime softening, and 4 million gallons per day is RO. <clears throat> the reason for the RO is that you all can withdraw water from lower quality areas. You have a series of wells. You have 32 wells. There's The majority are out west, um, west of 95, in the recharge areas. And those the water quality there is less uh, saline, higher quality with respect to chlorides. But you also have a series of wells in the Division Avenue area that require a higher level of treatment to remove more total dissolved solids and chlorides. So your plant has the ability to do both. This is very unique and the only plant in uh, Volusia County that, that has both types of systems. Um, right now, the um, permanent withdrawal capacity as far as the consumptive use permitting that we discussed earlier is 9.4 million gallons per day. Uh, right now, we're using less than that. The projected demand in 2025 is about 6.7, and at 2035 is 8.38. So the permitted capacity and the production capacity at your plant is sufficient to carry you through the, uh, the planning period, which is 2035. Um, we uh, prepared a utility master plan about two or three years ago, and you know part of that planning document evaluates your water production capacity, the environmental impacts, and all of the things that it takes to to supply and, and sustainably supply the city and, uh, and happy to report Ormond Beach is, you know, certainly ahead of the curve on pretty much all of these aspects. <clears throat> now, how about the wastewater plant? Who all knows where the wastewater plant is? Not as many. <laughs> the wastewater plant is uh, by Orchard and Wilmette. So it's uh, a fairly large facility. It's near the, uh, the solid waste transfer station, again, near the railroad tracks and it's uh, right adjacent to the city's public works building. Um, the plant has uh, 8 million gallons per day treatment capacity. It is an AWT plant. Um, in Florida, you'll see different types of treatment plants, and, and to us uh, geeks that like to look into this stuff, an AWT is, is the highest level of treatment that you can sustainably and, and practically provide at this type of a level. So it means that you're getting uh, reductions to uh, 5531 standards, five parts BOD, five parts suspended solids, three nitrogen, one phosphorus. What that means, it's, it's a, a very uh, high level of treatment that reduces nutrients and reduces uh, solids to the maximum extent practical that you can utilize it for public access reclaimed water. The uh, disposal methodologies is to the Halifax River and to public access reclaimed water. Um, happy to report that the uh, current reclaimed water recovery at the plant is about 68%. And so during the wet periods, you'll have less recovery. During the dry periods, you'll have a higher level of recovery. So right now, we're at 68% and, and aiming to get up into the 80s and 90s. And there's a, a lot of different projects and things that are going on to try to increase that reclaimed consumption and decrease discharge to the, to the river. Um, current ADF, as far as the flow, the average daily flow is 4.76. Uh, 2025 is about 5.4. And looking at a, uh, 2035, about 6.7. So again, capacity is adequate, and the uh, the treatment methodology is, is about as good as it gets. And we are working towards higher levels of, of recovery. Um, this is the kind of a map of the reclaimed water distribution network. So what you can see is you've got a, a cluster on the east side by the uh, by the beachside areas. You've got a, a fairly significant infrastructure of, of what we call purple pipes, reclaimed water distribution lines, and they take high service pumping from the wastewater treatment plant and bring it and trans convey it across the river to uh, uh, residential customers and golf courses and other users. Uh, you'll also notice a big line that runs up US-1 and comes back down Airport Road and goes all the way out to breakaway trails in Hunter's Ridge. And that's an area that um, has an independent network of reclaimed pipes, a lot of which were installed with the original construction of the subdivision. So there's reclaimed water uh, storage and pumping at that site, and we're getting ready to expand that capacity. And that's probably one of the biggest areas that, that uses quite a bit of reclaimed water. And it is also in the vicinity of the wells. So whatever, we're, whatever work we're doing and whatever beneficial harvesting we get of reclaimed water, we're completing that hydrologic cycle and bringing it back into the ground at that point. 
this is a really great graph. Um, it talks about the reclaimed water service areas, where we're feeding as far as the North Penn, South Peninsula, Oceanside, Tomoka Oaks, and River Bend. But what I'd really like to kind of point out is if you look at the top graph, that's your water consumption. It's kind of hard to see, but it, it peaked at around two, 2005, 2006. And you'll notice that there's been a steady decline in consumption. Um, so right now we're holding steady at about 5.4 million gallons per day, and it's been that way for about 10 years, which is fantastic. Uh, what you also see is the, the green line in the middle, that's your F, the sewage treatment volume, and it's had a modest increase, but it's, it's been fairly flat. Um, what I think is most striking is the bottom line, that's your, uh, that's your reclaimed water. So starting in the, the late 90s, it was non-existent, and then you'll see uh, it climb rapidly, and if you look at that climb between 2005 and 2010, you'll see about a 1, 1 1.5 million gallon per day spike in reclaimed water consumption. And coincidentally, at that same time, you'll see about a 1.5 million gallon per day drop in potable water consumption. I wouldn't say they're exactly, you know, one is equal to the other, but there certainly is a relationship there because potable irrigation largely is coming off the potable system. And this is a replacement methodology for that for that water. So you can see that, you know, we're seeing flat to declining use in the potable and, and groundwater consumption in a in an increase in the reclaimed water. So it's a it's a pretty telling graph. Um, closing up, just talking a little bit about septic to sewer. Right now in the uh, the, the Ormond Beach service area, there's about fifty five hundred opportunities for septic to sewer. Um, I say opportunities because generally um, from an environmental perspective, uh, septic tanks do have the potential to, to leach nitrogen and other pollutants into the uh, surficial aquifer, but uh, it, it's not a cheap proposition. So this lists the uh, you know areas. Everything in green is inside the city limits. Everything in blue is outside. So you'll notice that a, a large portion of this is in the North Penn area, and uh, the, the city's looked at these areas and, and planned for these. So if there are potential opportunities, grant, app grant opportunities that we can uh, cost-effectively uh, pursue these. They're, they're out there, and they're they are in the planning stages. But uh, it's it's about ten to fifteen thousand dollars per household to go to a retrofit. So it's it's not an inexpensive proposition. And with that, I'll pass it to Sean. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, if if I can just step in for a moment and remind you, if you have questions about the presentations. Write them either on the cards or the post-its and put them in the bowl, and we'll get to them in a few minutes. Thank you, everybody. Um, again, my name is Sean Finley. I'm the deputy city engineer for the city of Ormond Beach. Um, I've been asked to bring it home. We've got some, we had some great speakers, so hopefully I don't de take anything away from what they presented tonight. They did a great job. Um, the, the project that, that Brad spoke about, the projects that Curtis spoke about, I'm in the fortunate position that I get to work on a lot of those projects. I get to touch some of those. I get to get have a feeling for them. So, as much fun as these guys have described it as it is to them, it's just as much fun to me, and, and you know, hopefully we can make it so you can see you know, how important they are to the city. Um, I'm going to talk about our water. I'm going to wrap it up here with our environmental water objectives. Um, number one, we started off with clay, and, and, and a big objective for us is to safeguard wetlands. We, we, we've made it an objective to continue to support and protect, manage wetlands via the regulations and policies established by our regulatory partners, St. John's River Water Management District, Volusia County, the DEP, and, and, and the City of Ormond Beach. We do that through Chapter 321 of our Land Development Code. That's our Ormond Beach Wetlands Ordinance. Um, at, at its heart are the Volusia County standards. But we've taken that and we've expanded upon it. We, we've made it local to us. We, we put in the, the elements that, that, that relate to the Tomoka River, the Halifax River. Um, we've, we've added elements to, that, that relate to construction techniques. So it, 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 it takes those same regulations that everybody through the county are, are adhering to and, and takes it up a notch specifically for what we do here in Ormond. Um, if we provide for concurrent review. We do our review along with St. John's or, or DEP, depending on who's involved. And, and so it's a very streamlined, it's a very efficient method, and it, and it makes the best use of not just the professionals who are involved in the design of those projects, but the professionals who are making the, the, the regulations. We couldn't ask for better scientists than we have at St. John's. They, they, they know their stuff, they do a good job, and, and we, take the, we, we take the lead from them and allow them to, to help us to make good decisions. Um, and, and like Clay said, we provide wetland buffers around the Tomoka River and its tributaries. Stormwater management. I've got a picture there 
of a study that sits on my shelf that I use more than any other study that I've used in the past 10 years. After the, follow, after the unnamed storm in 2009, we commissioned one of our consultants to, to do an update of a model that's been built upon for the past 30 years. Um, it took the, the conditions from the storm and, and gave us an idea of what could happen and what happened during that storm. And more importantly, what it did is it gave us a blueprint for what to do. And if you look on the left-hand side of the screen, Central Park Lake Inter Interconnect, Bennett Lane Stormwater Management Project, Wilmette Avenue Flapgate, Riverside Drive Improvements, Corrugated Metal Replacement, these are all things that were spelled out in this as a blueprint for us to, to make decisions, and we've accomplished those since, the, since this report was um, published in March 2010. It gave us a, a, some, some guidance to how to go about things. Where do we go from now? In 2019, we're going to do an, uh, an update of that stormwater master plan. It's going to give us a roadmap for the next five or ten years, give us the projects that we're looking to do. We're also conducting some more, um, constructing some more improvements on Fleming Avenue. Um, we're making more improvements to Wilmette Avenue. And as uh, Curtis mentioned, we're in installing more stream gauges along Laurel Creek, which is that main creek that runs through the center of town, so that we can know how to manage those storms and the water after the storms. Water quality, here's our objectives. Maintain sufficient water supply. Expand reclaimed water recovery. We're currently at that 68% that, that, that Brad mentioned. That could be the most important thing that we do for water quality, is to make sure that we are putting less and less water into the, into the Halifax River. That, you see the algae blooms in different parts of the state. This is what we're doing by putting that out there. It's also re reducing our dependence on some of the water. Not putting finished water on our yards is a big thing. Um, we're reducing effluent to the Halifax River. We're expanding, we've expanded our, our wastewater plant. Um, we're working on continuing these reclaimed water main projects. Um, more projects on South Penn. We're going to continue doing those things. We're, we're working, we worked the past couple years expanding it on the beach side on the South Penn. We're going to do some projects right now. We've got a project ongoing that brings reclaimed water to the Deer Creek section of Hunters Ridge. We're going to be doing a new breakaway trails, reuse and storage pumping upgrades. That was one of the projects that Jennifer mentioned in her project, in her presentation. We're expanding our well field, and we're looking at the possibility of septic to sewer co conversion. With that, I'm going to turn it back to Raphael, and thank you all for listening. I'd like to thank all of our presenters again for working within very, working very well within very difficult time constraints. Thank you. Um, Okay, so we'd like to take at least 15 minutes or so and um, answer as many of your questions as we can get to in the next few minutes, and then we will turn to the table discussions, and we'll wrap up tonight with some polling that'll at least give us a flavor of your table discussions. The richness of those discussions will be in the comments you leave us, but you'll get some sense of it from our final polling. So. Um, as we have in the past, we're going table to table. We're going to pick one card or piece of paper at random from each bowl. And Hal will read it out, and then we'll see if it goes to one of our subject matter experts or one of the city staff. And I'll remind you that as I randomly try and pick one from each table, all of the ones in your, in your bowl will get answered, and you'll be able to see those online. So just because I don't pick yours doesn't mean it wasn't important. So... I think so, thank you. All right, the first question here is, how safe is reuse water for garden use or pets to drink? You wanna? The, the reclaimed water, and Brad, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it, it's processed to drinking water standards. Um, there are, you wouldn't wanna drink it because there is the, uh, the, the uh, possibility of there being some pathogens in there, um, but where you can use it, you can use it on your, on your grass, you can use it on some of your non-edible fruits and vegetables, that's where you're recommended to do it. Uh, you know, as far, I, you, I, nobody wants to ingest it, but if you get it on your feet or if your pet gets it on their paws, it's not going to do anything negative to them. Okay. Just hang on to the mic and pass it off as needed. Okay. Hell. The next question is, are there any wetlands between the river and I-95 adjacent to Granada Boulevard? Uh, hmm. 
We have a lot of heads looking various directions. Steve, you want to take a shot? I would say yes. I don't have a map in front of me to, to say that, but yes, th there are wetlands within that corridor. They may not be immediately on uh, Granada Boulevard, but they're certainly within that area. Um, as I'm thinking, uh, Chelsea Place certainly has some wetlands. There are wetlands behind Lowe's. So yes, within the corridor, there are wetlands that, that are within that corridor. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question I have is, could you explain wetland mitigation rules? That may be a longer answer, but briefly, I guess. Clay or Jennifer? I don't know who wants to take a shot at that. The answer to that question will be in my three-hour lecture later. <laughs> <laughs> there is no short answer to it. It is uh, governed by uh, state statute and an extensive amount of uh, rules. Um, the Water Management District primarily uh, regulates them through what they call an environmental resource permit. And essentially the applicant, the landowner, has to come in and get a permit from the district to uh, conserve in perpetuity and also restore a, a, a piece of land, um, basically to enhance the hydrology on it. Then the district, um, after that process, and also the federal jurisdiction, that gets a little more complicated, but then they assign uh, a number of credits to award for that preservation and restoration. So uh, when the new big box comes in for a development and they're going to have to, uh, they cannot avoid a one acre take of wetland, the permit for that development is going to require them to then go and purchase uh, at least, you know, a credit of, uh, of wetland mitigation from Wetland Mitigation Bank. So uh, it's more complicated than that, but that's the easiest way to look at it. Um, and we, that credit results that, in the preservation of? Uh, it, it, that, res that credit results or contributes to the perpetual preservation of that area. And so as a policy, when we first started getting into wetland, protection and conservation, we you said, look, let's preserve stuff on site. Uh, that would be, that was kind of the preferred method that led to the protection of lots of isolated places full of cattails. And so the, the policy morphed into this uh, process of trying to preserve larger areas that would have a greater wetland function in, and be protected in perpetuity as the trade-off. But that's a very simple, dumbed-down answer, and we'll stay tuned for the longer version. Hang, hang on to the mic and just give it to. Can I add one thing? Of, uh, the one thing I will add is that the uh, mitigation, de there it goes, depending on where the development is occurring, there are two special basins of the Halifax and the Tomoka River. And so any mitigation for those two would have to occur within those watersheds. So if it's in the Halifax Basin that the development is occurring, that mitigation is supposed to occur in that area. Okay. Uh, there are always, but of course there's this exception and that exception, but that's the way that it's supposed to go. Thank you, Hal. Okay, water supply is good during the wet years. But how do you supplement supply during the dry years? Yeah, Jennifer. Uh, during the dry years, depending on how much water we are using, that is when, like if you remember last year, Going into the summer, we had ordered a, or sent out a water shortage order because our water levels in the aquifer were getting to too low a levels. And so that is how we as a district work to make sure that water is going to be available uh, for us and for our environment is by having those water shortage orders where we're bringing to everyone's attention let's reduce our water use. Uh, it's not going to be something that we want to have a, a, 
everybody, let's turn off the water and not have any additional water being generated. So that's, that's a, a, a difficult balance. But from the water supply side, they may have a, a place that they're able to, to get it. Uh, again, as Clay mentioned, it, it's, it's a long answer, but I'll try to uh, reduce it as much as possible. The, uh, the, the groundwater modeling is done for the consumptive use permitting process. So there's a very complex series of modeling efforts that can be undertaken to evaluate water withdrawal from this area, this area, this area, down to the individual wells that are pulling water out of the aquifer. And then you've got a model that, that models the, the underground geology in the uh, aquifer and what uh, recharge is happening where. And the primary constraint generally has to do with wetlands. And when you have wells in close proximity to wetlands, it's good that they're being recharged from those, but during drought periods, you don't want to over withdraw from those wells. So um, the consumptive use permitting process is essentially striking that balance between science and demand to determine, okay, how much water can you withdraw from the, the city's 32 wells that are located throughout the entire service area? And it's, you know, it's a fairly complex process, but it is highly regulated and it is scientifically determined on what is the sustainable yield that you can withdraw without negatively affecting the natural systems that you're pulling it from. So. Thank you. Uh, the question from this table is, what happens to our treatment capacity after 2035? I think you showed that most of your capacity was being used by 2035. What happens after that? Uh, well, the Demand trends will be analyzed, and they're analyzed about every five years. The current capacity at the uh, wastewater treatment plant uh, can be expanded. There's technology, and, and there are actually plans in place that, that can be implemented as the need arises to take that plant to 10 million gallons per day. So right now, the water treatment plant has about 12, which has a factor of safety of almost two. So I think as far as the water supply and the treatment capacity goes, you're in, in really good shape. Um, the wastewater plant will probably need to be expanded, but it's probably not within the next 10-year planning period. But there's technology to do it, and there's space on the site to get it done. Thank you. You may hang on to that for a second. <laughs> uh, I think this one may go to you, too. Uh, this is regarding reclaimed water goals. Uh, how do we plan on increasing it from 68%, and who will pay for that? One of the big things that we can do to, to increase it from 68 to, to 70 and 80 percent is exactly what we're doing, to expand that network. The 68 percent that we had was essentially taken before we made the improvements on the South Peninsula this past year. We're slowly getting those people online. We're getting those folks to sign up, to, to, to make connections. They're going to be the ones who are going to take us from 68 to 75 to 80 percent. Um, what do we do when we get to, to, to 80, 90 percent? That's, that's one of the questions we need to look to. Uh, one of the options is possibly doing interconnect with another city um, and, and, and taking some of those who don't have the infrastructure to, to discharge their, their, their reclaimed water. A and then we're doing double good, so. Thank you. Okay, the next question here is, does the city have an environmental advisory committee? If not, why not? There is not an envi environmental advisory board. There was one, um, I don't know the exact date, I think it was around 2008, 2009. Those functions were rolled into the planning board. That environmental advisory board uh, reviewed basically the conservation and the coastal element within the comprehensive plan. So those duties were assigned to the planning board and that board was eliminated again in 2008, 2009 in that time period. Okay, the question from the table up here in the front. When will the DEP seriously start mandating the replacement of septic tanks? <laughs> if you can't see from the back, that elicited some chuckling up here. Um, who wants to, would the chuckler like to take a shot at it? I, I, this is it, this is it. You know, I gotta tell you something. This is, I haven't had, Everybody wants to be number one in something, right? Why Volusia County wants to be number one in the number of septic tanks is just beyond me, okay? We are now over 100,000 septic tanks in Volusia County, okay? 
Now, um, you know, that's not Orem Beach, but I, I, I wrote down the notes on, you got North Peninsula issues here. But in Southeast Volusia, it is the tangible damage that we're doing to the Indian River Lagoon. In West Volusia, it is that Blue Spring, Delian Springs, and Gemini Springs are impaired uh, by the nutrient increases. And Gemini Springs, that we all own as a county park, has been closed to swimming since 2004, okay? The bill, just the bill for replacing this, just gonna get, keep getting bigger. So uh, nobody wants to touch this issue. See, I'm not running for office, so I can get up here and I can say all these things, but nobody, in fact, they're running in Deltona right now, they're running for office by saying, we won't force you to hook up the sewer. But, but we've all got to step up and understand this is a real issue, and it's not just DEP. Um, I mean, uh, D DEP would tell you that, you know, they have limitations on what they can do. It's actually the Department of Health that issues building permits, and the local governments are required to honor those uh, permits from DOH. So it's, it, it, we've made it very complicated. We've made it very easy to get septic tanks, and, uh, and it is a major uh, issue. So um, I don't know. I'm sorry. I got off on a tangent. But you understand the issue, and um, it's something that all of us are going to have to work to try to fix. Okay. And since we don't have DEP here today or the Department of Health, we'll... Um, all right, our next question, Go on. will the wastewater treatment plant ever fully stop discharge to Strickland's Creek and the Tomoka and Halifax rivers? Brief answer. Uh, the, the only surface water discharge from the wastewater plant is into the Halifax River. So there is no other permitted discharge site for that wastewater plant. Um, getting to z absolute zero discharge is nearly impossible. When you have storm events, when you have um, you know, very high rainfall events and you don't have the demand for reclaimed water, the water has to go somewhere. And when it is highly diluted, you have a lot of, of rainfall occurring and, and it is diluted in the river as well. However, I can say that getting to essentially zero discharge where you're augmenting where you're using stormwater sources, where you're using water potentially from Holly Hill through an interconnect, or you're using other sources so that on an annual average, you're actually recharging and you're actually utilizing more than 100% of the flow that comes into the plant. That is absolutely doable. And there are other places that are doing it. And so on an annualized basis, you can actually get above 100% by augmenting that reclaimed water. But as far as completely eliminating that, uh, that discharge, again, when it's the storms come and the rains come and the water has to go somewhere. Um, it has to go somewhere. Thank you. Okay. Question from this table is why doesn't the city charge less money to put city water and sewage into areas where people have well and septics? Maybe more would consider the change. <laughs> that might be a question that we have to get some, a little bit of deeper answer for, and we'll be glad to post that one on the website. Okay. Um, is the current charge reflective of the actual cost to the city? I think it's, I think we've, we've done rate studies, and I think it's very reflective of, of what it costs to, to provide water and sewer service to, to residents in, in those areas, and um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a good question, but we'll need to give a little bit deeper answer to that one. Okay. Thank you. Okay. What is the biggest contributor to local waters being classified as impaired? Is it septic tanks, stormwater overflow, or something else? Okay, we have the bikes over there. Yeah, there's, um, it's a combination. Um, it is, uh, uh, you have, uh, it's, it's nutrients. The, the primary cause of impairment of Halifax um, and the Indian River Lagoon in East Volusia are nutrients. It is a combination of stormwater discharges that are not treated or attenuated. Uh, north of the inlet, it's, it's a lot of wastewater discharges uh, and uh, septic tanks that are part of the system. The other thing is that, you know, uh, for most of East Volusia, uh, we've significantly increased 
the uh, watershed. You know, we, we put in, from the earliest times, we put in canals to drain the water table so that development could proceed west. So that increases the amount of stormwater that makes its way uh, into, uh, into the river. So it's, it's, it's a complex matter, and that's the best answer I can give at this point. So, so you can't really pin it down to just one. Yeah, not just okay, one. thanks. Oh, I'm sorry, Joe. If you have reclaimed water, if you have reclaimed water, you can reduce your impact by not putting as much fertilizer or not even thinking about needing that fertilizer because the reclaimed water, again, although the nutrients are, are, uh, are lower than when it came in, it does have nutrients in that water. So you can always remember that. Thank you. Why do we continue to put fluoridide in the water? That again is a question that we'll, we'll have to get an answer for that, that is representative of what our utilities department wants to, you know, would say. Yeah, they're, they're not here tonight, so thank you. Okay. Will depleting the aquifer cause sinkholes? So if you remember that picture of the aquifer layers, you are more likely to get sinkholes in those areas of recharge because there isn't that clay that can help hold up the water. And so as we have those large caverns under the ground in our, in our limestone and our karst topography, when we decrease the amount of water that's in them, then there's nothing to help hold that hole open. And so that is when sinkholes can occur. But they can occur as the water table is depleted and then rapidly refilled, or they can occur even with there being water in the aquifer. But it, it definitely can help them to cause more to happen. Okay, thanks. Okay. How many tons of dirt were required to cover the wetlands on West Granada where the forest was clear cut? And where did the dirt come from? I can answer the second part easier than the first part. The, the dirt was from the uh, stormwater retention pond that provided stormwater and compensating storage uh, for the project. We can go through the project and get you that number of the cubic yards of fill that was, was put on the project. Thank you. Why doesn't stormwater go right into the city treatment plant, as in California? Brad? Um, when stormwater comes and lands on the ground, we, we measure that water flow in cubic feet per second. We don't measure that in gallons per minute. So you can have uh, literally millions of gallons of water. Um, one, one, uh, one or two inch rainfall event over this city could, it could generate, you know, 50, 70 million gallons of water instantaneously. So the, the type of volumes and, and the, the intensity and the duration of, of water that's, uh, that is caused by runoff would dramatically exceed anything that could be reasonably treated for and managed in a wastewater collection system and a treatment system. Is water from our aquifer rivers or springs being sold to outside companies? If so, why? Do we have an answer to that in the room? The water, the water that is in the aquifer rivers, lakes, it is not being sold. It is a public resource. And so it is utilized for bottling companies, things like that, by they go through the permitting and uh, request the specific amount that they're wanting. And we can't forget that not only do bottled water use our water from our aquifer, but also the soda and beer industry also utilize that water from our aquifer. So those are the places that are utilizing it, but they do not, uh, pay for it as like a business transaction or it's not sold to them Are that they way a either. Are they a significant user or do they, do they get their 
water directly from the aquifer or from utilities in the cities and counties? Typically, they would be getting it from the aquifer, but there are definitely, uh, there are utilities that a portion of their usage is going to, to uh, bottling companies and those sorts of things. So may mostly like uh, beer production or those sorts of things. But uh, of 2016's data, I have those numbers that I ran in, 1% uh, of that overall freshwater usage was for the beverage industry as a whole. Okay, thank you. So. Thank you. Okay, didn't Ormond Beach have a stormwater issue in last year's hurricane? What happened? I think we all had issues with, you know, coming out of a, a hurricane. Um, we, we have different areas that experience different problems. Different, those different problems are caused from different effects. The, the storms that occurred in 2009 left a lot of water on the ground, and, and, and those, those were um, expressed in the Central Park area. We had some flooding this past after hur Hurricane Irma and previous, and, and um, the, the, Matthew, thank you. Um, before that, because there was a there was some there was some high tide issues that caused a difficulty for water to get out, and that was that was what we saw in the north um, part of town here. So we're going to have issues. That's why we're doing an update of our stormwater master plan to be able to identify some solutions to help us reduce those those issues. We certainly didn't have the number of houses that flooded that we did 10 years ago, though. Thank you. I actually have two questions on this card. One is what's being done to clean up. Halifax River, and the other is how many historic trees were removed from where the Wawa will be? So, let's, uh, brief answers to both. Uh, if there is a brief answer to the first one. He's got the mics to you, right? The, 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 um, um, in, in south, I'll give it this one, south of the inlet, we're in the Indian River Lagoon program. Brad and I serve on the management committee of the five county area that is involved in doing the restoration plan for the Indian River Lagoon. Um, this, uh, this last year, the, com the council voted to expand that uh, basin to uh, take in the Halifax River for planning purposes. So that, you know, I think the communities in the Halifax River can begin to see some of the benefits that, that we're, as we're learning about restoration for the Indian River Lagoon. Um, the, the big difference between the Halifax River and the Indian River Lagoon is that um, beginning in 1990, most of uh, the cities in the Indian River Lagoon were required to get the wastewater treatment or wastewater discharge out of the lagoon and to move toward more aggressive reuse. So for instance, we're basically at 100% reuse uh, in New Smyrna, but north of the inlet where that wasn't required, you still have um, a lot of discharge, not from Ormond, from Daytona, uh, and from Port Orange. They're, 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 doing, they're, they're doing more to advance uh, reuse but um, it, it's, it's been, you know, it's, it's lagged behind what we've done to the south. So it's more complex. It, there's no direct programs that are requiring uh, the focus of restoration, but we do hope that uh, the communities around the Halifax River will participate. Thank you. And there is a short answer to the second part of the question, uh, yeah, whether we have it. We're gonna make sure that we get numbers right, but to the best of my knowledge, there was a total of 34 historic trees on the Granada Point. Of the 34, four were deemed unhealthy, dead, or diseased. So that left 30 trees left. There were 19 trees saved on the north side of the property, and there were 11 historic trees removed on the south side of the property. So we'll go back and verify those numbers, but to the best of my knowledge and my recollection, so they saved 63% and they removed 37% of, the, of the historic trees. Thank you. Okay. How often is the water in the Tomoka Basin and the Halifax River in Ormond Beach tested, and where are the results posted? Do we have the answer? I do not. If y'all have, we, we can we can look into that. Yeah. We can see if we can find an answer that that gives justice to that question. If it's in our network. 
we have all of our monitoring sites on our website, and that's sjrwmd.com. And so you're able to see where those monitoring sites are and the trends that are occurring with the nutrients that you're of interest in. Within your website, what should they look for? It would look be under uh, monitoring. Data and, Data and tools, okay. Data and tools, okay. So Thank it, you. it occurs in multiple places. Thank you. Okay, and the final question. Uh, uh, one final quick table. Uh, Brad just reminded me that the county does monitor that, and it's on their website. So Volusia County Environmental Division has it on their website. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is a small, isolated wetland of any major use? There's, again, editorial chuckling. Um. Well, I, I think the, the, the point is that, at least in this county, it is regulated and it is protected. And uh, but we do go to that issue of functionality. And so when you apply that uniform UMAM test of functionality, it's not going to, ordinarily it's not going to score out um, like that you know, beautiful bayhead or uh, area with the, the cypress knees. But, but we've worked under a premise for the last um, 30 years that the goal is no net loss of wetlands. And so that's what drives the equation. Thank you. Okay, is there any table we did not get to? Okay, we have a little less, is it, did we not get to your table? Uh, there probably is a short answer to that question, just the definition of mitigation, and we'll put it on the website too. The, the, the functional definition of mitigation uh, is uh, acts of conservation and or restoration uh, that are done to offset the impacts uh, to a wetland. Uh, and so, you know, if you, you take a, a wetland and you protect it through a perpetual easement, that's conservation. If you take a piece of land that's been, the hydrology has been affected and you do restorative actions, that's restoration. Those types of things are considered mitigation. Okay, thank you. And Steve has a follow quick follow-up. Quick follow-up. For the Environmental board. Advisory Board, um, it was eliminated in 2011 with Ordinance 2011-01. Thank, thank you. Thank you. On to the mic. Okay, so we have a little over 15 minutes. Um, we apologize for compressing the discussion portion. How we'll lead you into that in just a moment. We'll reserve about a minute and a half at the end for the wrap-up polling. And a reminder now, and there will be another one later, there's an evaluation form at the end of your packet. Um, the responses on those have been great. We've been getting 75, 80% responses back. That's really good. Those are really helpful to us, not just the numbers, but the comments. So we'll still, you'd still have time to go through the discussion questions. There's a lot of value to that. And we'll take a minute at the end to poll based on your discussions, Hal? Turn to page three in your packet. There and, and again, two, thank you to our presenters. There are two questions we want you to, to look at. The first question, what are the principal environment and water quality issues facing Ormond Beach? We want you to write as many of those ideas and issues down as you, as you would like and can. If you can go around the table and give everybody an opportunity to at least share one of their ideas, and then write it on one of the um, yellow sticky pads and put it on the bottom half of the paper that's there on your table. That's the only way we'll get it recorded, is if you write it on the yellow paper and put it on the bottom half of the sheet here. Any idea, any issue that you, um, facing Ormond Beach that needs to be addressed. Then, once you've done that, then we're gonna ask you Answer the second question. In this one, the first one, you can write as many ideas and issues as you want. On the second one, which is, what do you think is the single most important thing for Ormond Beach to achieve relative to environment and water quality over the next five years? On that one, put it at the top of the page, but only one per person. In other words, if you got five people at your table, maybe there can be at most five of what is the most important. As many ideas and issues as you want to put down on the bottom half of the page, for each of you individually, your single most important 
at the top. Okay? And share with each other and talk to each other as you need to. same time um, a lot of people were familiar with the your own
Are they a different pair than the ones that come to I'm at that point too. Okay, I'm going to get their attention here in one more minute. Okay, if I can have your attention for just a couple of minutes here at the end. Um, first of all, if you need to stay a couple of minutes to finish writing your post-its, feel free. We, we're going to formally wrap up at 8 o'clock. We want to respect that time, but if you need more time to keep writing, not a problem. Second, just a reminder, all of the questions in the bowls from the earlier session will be answered online. Whether or not we got to them um, here in the meeting, and, and you will see written answers to the ones we did get to. So all of those will be answered online. Third, remember to fill out your evaluation, and then we want to do a little bit of polling to wrap up with, okay? So again, I'll need your attention. I know I, I really apologize for the limited time for a conversation, but if we can get a little bit of polling done here just to give you a flavor of where you wound up as a group. We have three questions for you, only three. The first is, overall, what's your perception of how Ormond Beach is addressing environmental and water quality issues? A one is great, a five, sort of somewhere in the middle, and a nine is terrible. Should really read terribly. <laughs> um, so very well, <laughs> uh, sort of five is the middle of the scale, neither really well nor really badly and nine is terrible. So choose your answers and press send. Okay, we have fewer people in the room at the moment, so we had more than 100 at, at the start. Um, going once, going twice, Again, what's your perception of how Ormond Beach is addressing environmental and of how well Ormond Beach is addressing environmental and water quality issues? Going once, going twice. I'm too close to the, sorry. Okay, we're still getting responses. So going once, going twice. <laughs> All right, we, we want to hear from everybody. So get your answer in. One more, come on, one more. There you go. Okay. Yeah, two, three. All right. So going once, going twice. Um, hmm. I believe that's. I, I'm having. I apologize. I, I believe it's 31% said great. 10%. Um, Gave it a 2, 12% a 3, 7% a 4. About 19% were smack in the middle. Um, and then 10% for a 6, 3 and 3 for 7 and 8, and 7 for 9. 7% of you said that the city is handling those issues terribly. So uh, well over 70% were a five or above, and 50% uh, were in the top three, you know, one, two, or three, and then uh, about 13% were in the bottom three. So on the whole, most of you think it's doing okay, but there are some who have serious reservations. Second question, think back to when your connection to Ormond Beach began. Remember, we asked you that question early on, and compare um, how the city is dealing with environment um, and water quality issues now to then. Is it much better, a one, about the same, a five, or much worse, a nine? 
So have things gotten better over time or worse? You're on your, your honor to only use your rolling device. <laughs> this is Florida, but still. <laughs> we don't, we don't. We're up there pretty close. Going once, going twice. One more, come on, one more. No? Okay. All right. Um, yeah, very similar percentages. 30% said it's doing much better. It's better now. 9% gave it a 2, 13 a 3, 1% a 4. Uh, so again, that's over 50%, 53% or 2% to be exact in the top 1, 2, or 3. 19%, exactly the same percentage, about the same. Uh, then a 7 for a 6, a 7 for a 7, 7%. Gave it a 6, 7% a 7, 1% an 8, and 12% a 9, much worse. So the numbers at the bottom end are a little higher. Uh, you've got 20% uh, in, in the bottom three, but you have more than 50% in the top three. And now the last question. Again, there's no magic to these uh, options. We want a sense of which of these come closest to what you identified as the single most important thing for the city to achieve over the next five years. We will look first to your post-its. Those are the answer. This is just sort of a sense of it before you leave the room. So which of the following environment or water quality issues comes closest to your highest priority? To your highest priority. Accelerating septic to sewer conversion, acquiring conservation lands, Enhancing stormwater management program, enhancing tree preservation, or enhancing wetland preservation. So which comes closest to your highest priority? Again, sense of the room before we leave. Your answers, your real answers are in the post-its. But which of these comes closest? Okay, going once, going twice, let's see what, okay, 48% of you said that accelerating septic to sewer conversions comes closest to your highest priority. 15% suggested acquiring conservation lands comes closest to your highest priority. 14% enhancing the stormwater management program. <clears throat> 5% enhancing tree preservation, and 18% enhancing wetland preservation. So that's a sense of the room tonight at the end of the discussion with the information you heard. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Again, if you need more time to write your answers, your, your full answers, write them on the post-its, fill out the evaluations. Leave, leave your evaluations on the table. Thank you very much.